Welcome back everybody. Uh, today we're going to cover water and solutions and so we're going to take a look first at the structure of water. Remember that oxygen is far more electronegative than hydrogen and this gives oxygen the partial negative charge in the water molecule. So this is a polar molecule. This creates a bent shape because and remember the bent shape is polar also and the two unpaired electrons are what fills out the rest of the tetrahedron. Water molecules form strong hydrogen bonds between each other and water molecules are also attracted to one another better than other molecules its same size. Liquid water acts like a skin. Water forms round drops as a result of surface tension and this is all because of the hydrogen bonds. One water molecule will hydrogen bond to another and water can hydrogen bond to other water molecules all around it in all directions. A water molecule in the middle of a solution is pulled in every direction. However, at the surface, the water molecules are pulled across the surface and are closer together, which causes surface tension. Water drops are round because all the molecules on the edge are pulled toward the middle and gravity can flatten them, flatten them out onto a surface. Glass has polar molecules. This effect attracts water molecules and some of the pull is against gravity because of the hydrogen bonding. This is most commonly seen in the meniscus in a graduated cylinder, but it also um, is effective in the capillary action when you put blood in a capillary tube or the way capillary action draws water up into trees. Water has a very high heat capacity. So that means it takes more energy to get its molecules moving faster. Water has a heat capacity of 4.18 joules per gram per, per degree Celsius, whereas iron has only 0.447 joules per gram per degree Celsius. To find the heat capacity, you take the mass times the change in temperature times the heat capacity, and that gives you the total heat, which is Q. So let's do this problem. How much heat is needed to raise the temperature of 25 grams of iron by 75 degrees? Okay, so let's start working on that one right here. Okay, so we know that the heat capacity of iron, which is C, oh, I don't like that size, so let's do it bigger, is 0.447 joules per gram degree Celsius. And remember that our equation is Q equals M delta T C. So we want to find out how much heat is needed to raise the temperature of 25 grams. So we know that our mass is 25 grams of iron by 75 degrees. So our delta T is 75 degrees C. Okay, so we just plug that in. So Q equals 25 times 75, sorry, let me put in the units, degrees Celsius times 0 0.447 joules per <clears throat> gram degree Celsius. So that one goes off and that one goes off. And so I, we get our final Q as 838 joules. So 838 joules is how much heat is needed. You will be expected to know this equation and also be able to use it and manipulate it. When the atoms in a bond are the same, remember the electrons are shared equally. This is a nonpolar covalent bond. Not really interesting for what we're doing right now on thermochemistry. When two different atoms are bonded though, the electrons may not be shared equally and it can be create a polar covalent bond, but how do we measure how strong the atoms pull on the electrons? Well, a measure of how strongly the atoms attract electrons in a bond is electronegativity. The bigger the electronegativity difference, the more polar the bond. You subtract it. So basically, if you have a 0 to 0 0.4 you difference, you have a covalent, covalent nonpolar bond. 
If you have a 0 0.5 to a 1.0 difference, you have a covalent moderately polar bond. And a 1.0 to a 2.0, you have a covalent polar. And if it's greater than 2.0, you have an ionic bond. Okay, so you, you would use this Mulliken electronegativity's values and you would actually subtract them when you're looking at the bonds if you want to find out how much um, an atom is polar or nonpolar, etc. So when you show a bond is polar, remember it's not a whole charge, just a partial charge. So this little these little symbols up here with the plus and the minus, that's a lowercase delta. Delta is the triangle that I drew, drew for delta T for change in. Well, this is change in charge, and so it's a lowercase because it's not a huge change. It's not a complete change. So it's a change in charge. So a delta plus means a partially positive, and a delta minus means a partially negative charge. In this example, the fluorine pulls harder on the electron, so the electrons spend more time near the fluorine atom. You can also use this arrow with a, a bar across it to show where the electrons are, are spending most of their time. Okay, so, so let's rem remind you of the rules for polar molecules. Molecules with a partially positive and partially negative end are pol uh, polar, and it requires two things to be true. The molecule has to contain polar bonds, and this can be determined from the differences in electronegativity using those Mulliken values. And the symmetry cannot cancel out the effects of polar bonds, so you have to determine the shape using the Vesper rules. Symmetrical shapes are those without a lone pair in the central atom. So tetrahedral, trigonal planar, or linear molecules are all symmetrical, so they will cancel out the polarity. The mo molecule will be nonpolar if all of the atoms will be the same, and the shapes with the lone pairs on the central atom are not symmetrical. So here we have a list of atom uh, molecules. We've got hydrogen fluoride, we've got water, ammonia, carbon tetrachloride, carbon dioxide, and methyl chloride. So let's take a look at which ones are polar and which ones aren't. So I'm going to do the Vesper with you for the first four, and then you can do the last two. Okay, so we're going to get a new page. Okie dokie. So let's take a look at hydrogen fluoride. So fluorine, remember, has seven atoms. And it's going to be bonded to hydrogen, which shares that one. Does it have unbonded pairs on the central atom? Yes, it does. So your answer is yes. It is polar. Let's take a look at water. We already know this one, but just for the sake of security. Water has two pairs of, of lone pairs, and so that means that it is also polar. So, yes. The next one, ammonia. Remember, ammonia is trigonal pyramidal because it's got this lone pair up here. So because it's got a lone pair, Yes, the terminal atoms are all the same, so if it didn't have the lone pair, it would be nonpolar. And then finally, carbon tetrachloride. So we did the Vesper for that. We know that it's a tetrahedral molecule. All of the terminal atoms are the same, so the answer is no, it's not polar. Okay, so you're going to go back and do the other section. Um, the last two on the examples. So you're going to do carbon dioxide and methyl chloride. Intermolecular forces are what holds molecules to each other. They're what makes solid and liquid molecular compounds possible. The weakest of intermolecular forces are called van der Waals forces, and there are two kinds of those. There's dispersion forces and dipole interactions. Dipole interactions occur when polar molecules are attracted to one another, so it's kind of like a partial, almost magnetic uh, attraction. The partial positive on one molecule is attracted to the partial negative on another, and they're attracted, but they aren't completely linked like they would be in an ionic compound. So they don't have, they're not actually bonded, but they are attracted. 
Dispersion forces occur because the electrons are not evenly distributed at every instant in time. The result is temporary partial charges creating momentary dipoles. This affects the electrons in the molecule next to it, which creates sort of a chain reaction called an induced dipole. Molecules are essentially momentarily attracted to one another. The dispersion force itself depends only on the number of electrons in the molecule. Bigger molecules have more electrons, and more electrons mean stronger dispersion forces. For example, fluorine is a gas because it's a smaller molecule. Bromine is a liquid, it's a bigger molecule, and iodine is a solid, because remember these are all um, diatomic molecules. Hydrogen bonds are the attractive force caused by hydrogen bonded to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. That's it. Just those three. Fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen are very electronegative, so it t makes a very strong dipole. They're small, so the molecules can get really close together, and the hydrogen partially is shared with a lone pair in the molecule next to it. So it actually forms a bond. That's why we call it hydrogen bonding. It's a temporary bond. It can be broken but it's a lot stronger than the van der Waals forces of dipole interactions and, and so on. So hydrogen bonds are the strongest of the intermolecular forces that aren't actually bonds in a technical term. The vapor pressure is pressure caused by the vapor above a liquid at equilibrium. This is caused by the molecules that escape. Water has a low vapor pressure for a small molecule, and hydrogen bonding keeps the molecules from escaping because they stick together. Boiling point is when the vapor pressure equals the external pressure. Strong hydrogen bonds make it hard for water to become a gas, so it has a very high boiling point because of those hydrogen bonds. Um, the boiling point for water at sea level is 100 degrees Celsius. Because of the strong hydrogen bonds, it takes a large amount of energy to change water from a liquid to a gas. The heat of vaporization, which is what that energy is required, um, is 2,260 joules per gram. I mean, that's a huge amount. It takes this much energy to boil water over and above the energy put in to get the water to 100 degrees Celsius. You get this energy back when the steam condenses back to water, and the steam burns but heats things quite well. Most liquids also contract or get smaller if they're cooled, and they get more dense. When most substances are turned into solids, they are more dense than the liquid. For example, solid materials sink in liquid metal, but ice floats in water. Water becomes more and more dense as it cools until it reaches its densest point at 4 degrees Celsius. Then it becomes less dense. As the molecules slow down, they arrange themselves into a honeycomb-shaped crystal, and these are held together by strong hydrogen bonds. So water freezes at zero degrees Celsius, which is high for a small molecule, and again, due to those hydrogen bonds. So ice is 10% less dense than water, and water freezes from the top down. So it takes a great deal of energy to turn solid water into liquid water, or vice versa, and the, it's called the heat of fusion. The heat of fusion is not quite as high as the heat of vaporization, but it's still quite high for such a small molecule. It's 334 joules per gram. And you can see that crystalline lattice structure in, in the structure of snow, and this is a graphical representation as well as a picture of a micrograph of snow. Okay, so we're going to practice this one. Hopefully you have your printout of your notes. So for problems between 0 degrees and 100 degrees Celsius, you're not dealing with the heat of vaporization or the heat of fusion. So you just use Q equals M delta T delta times C. Remember, C is the heat capacity of water, Q is the heat. And for, uh, the heat capacity of water is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. So let's do this question. How much heat will it take to heat 23 grams of water from 23 degrees to 79 degrees? So let's go ahead and do that. So we know that our C is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. We know our mass is 23 grams. 
and we don't know quite what our delta T is. Our delta T is the top temperature minus the bottom, so it's 79 minus 23. So our delta T equals 56 degrees Celsius. So now we can plug it into the equation Q equals M delta T times C. So we put in 23 times 56, sorry, 23 grams times 56 degrees Celsius times 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. So our degree Celsius goes off, our grams goes off, we're left with joules, which is what we want, and it comes out to 5,384 joules. Let's get a new screen and take a look at the next one. So remember, if you're changing from a solid to a liquid or vice versa, so the temperature is at zero at that point, you have to do uh, the heat of fusion times the mass as well. Remember the heat of fusion for water is 334 degree, uh, 340, 334, sorry about that, joules per gram. So we're going to take that same 23 grams of ice and melt it at zero degrees. So our Q equals heat of fusion times the mass. So that's 334 joules per gram times 23 grams. Goes away, goes away. Q equals 76.82 joules. Let me get a new screen. And let's take a look at the next part. Remember, now we're going from a, a liquid to a gas or vice versa, so you have to factor in the heat of vaporization. So it's heat of vaporization times mass, and that's 2260 joules per gram for water. You will al always be told what the heat of fusion or vaporization is for any particular substance. Um, the 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius for heat capacity of water, you'll probably use that enough that you'll remember it, but it will be provided for you on the semester exam. But it is something that it's worth to have it in your memory banks if you can. It will save you a lot of time. So let's take that same 23 degrees cel uh, of water and boil it at 100 degrees Celsius. So we have to get it, we've already gotten it to 100 degrees, so Q equals mass times heat of vaporization. So 23 grams times 2260 joules per gram. So grams go away, we're left with joules. And that gives us 51,980 joules. Now, this is a huge number, especially for such a small molecule. This number is why evaporative cooling works for us, why sweating helps us a lot in um, cooling our bodies down. Okay, enough with the water. We're going to talk about what we do with water, and that's creating aqueous solutions. A solution is a homogeneous mixture, mixed molecule by molecule, and a solvent is the stuff that does the dissolving, and a solute is the stuff that gets dissolved. Solutions exist in all phases, solid, liquid, and gas. Aqueous solutions are solutions with water as the solvent, and water dissolves ionic solids and polar covalent solids the best, so like dissolves like. Oil is not nonpolar, and so oil and water don't mix. Salt is ionic and therefore polar, and so salt will dissolve into an aqueous solution just fine. Ionic solids dissolve in a process called solvation. So that's just a term you need to know. So water, what it does is it breaks apart the positive and negatively charged parts of a molecule and then surrounds each individual part. Solids will dissolve if the attractive force of the water molecules is stronger than the attractive force of the crystal lattice of the solid. If not, the solid is considered insoluble. 
water can do the same things to polar molecules. Other polar molecules can do the same things as well. Molecules that can hydrogen bond are very sol soluble in water. And water doesn't dissolve nonpolar molecules because they have no charges to attract the water molecules. They attract each other and separate from the nonpolar molecules, and the nonpolars are held together by dispersion forces. Nonpolar dissolves nonpolar because they attract each other at the same amount as they attract themselves. So, in other words, you have to determine whether you're going to use water or oil to dissolve a particular thing, and that's why we practice what's polar, what's not, uh, at the beginning of this lecture. So if you look at CaCl2, you'll know that you've got a, an ionic compound, so it's polar, therefore you'd use water. Methane is nonpolar. All the terminal atoms are the same and there's no lone pairs, so that means that you dissolve it with oil. Ammonia is polar because it's got a, a lone pair on, on the central atom, so you'd use water. Potassium sulfate is also polar, and so you would use water. So you're going to do the last three on your own, but you do need to know how to do this. So make sure that you practice and make sure you do the polarity. And if you're not able to do Vesper in your head, then you need to write it out. Make sure you've got it right. Electrolytes are substances that conduct electricity when melted or dissolved in water. Conducting is the same as saying charged particles moving, so ionic compounds are electrolytes. They fall apart into ions when dissolved or melted. Non-electrolytes are substances that don't conduct electricity when melted or dissolved in water, so most molecular compounds are non-electrolytes. They dissolve because they're polar, but they don't have to ionize to dissolve so they don't make charges. Weak electrolytes are substances that conduct electricity slightly when dissolved in water. Some molecular compounds are weak electrolytes because they partially fall apart when they dissolve. So they produce a few ions, but they don't make ions when melted. So that's important. They can produce weak electricity inside a solution, but when you melt them, they don't. The general rules to follow to determine if a compound is a strong or weak electrolyte are as follows. Acids that are considered strong acids are also strong electrolytes. So hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, hydroiodic acid, um, nitric acid, sulfuric acid, and chloric acid are very, very strong. The rest of the acids are considered weak acids and therefore are weak electrolytes. So I'm going to go through the list of strong acids again because you do need to know them. Hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hyd hydroiodic, uh, nitric, sulfuric, and chloric. The hydroxides of groups 1 and 2 are considered strong bases and are also strong electrolytes. The rest of the bases are considered as weak bases and are weak electrolytes. So in other words, if you have alkali or alkali earth metals that are bonded to a hydroxide, it's a strong base. If it's not, and not in that group, it's a weak base. So therefore it's a weak electrolyte. Most other ionic compounds are strong electrolytes. Halides and cyanides of heavy metals are, are generally considered weak electrolytes. An example would be, for example, lead iodide. Most organic compounds are non-electrolytes. Exceptions are the organic acids and bases. The difference between strong and weak electrolytes is the extent to which the ionic compounds dissociate into ions when placed in water. The greater the amount of dissociation, the greater the electrical conductance of the solution. The strong electrolytes are usually considered to be 100% dissociated, especially in dilute solutions, and weak electrolytes are usually dissociated less than 10%. The quantitative values of conductance is given for 0.10 molar aqueous solutions at 25 degrees Celsius and is in Siemens centimeter square per mole. Now, you're not going to be doing this on the semester exam, but you do have to understand what makes a strong electrolyte, what makes a weak electrolyte, etc. Okay, moving on to hydrates. Hydrates are ionic compounds that trap water in crystal structure. 
it's always the same number of water molecules and in every time you have the same hydrate. The number of water molecules is written after the dot in the formula. So this formula that you see up at the top is cobalt, chlor uh, chlor cobalt 2 chloride hexahydrate. Say that five times fast. Heating basically drives off the water as a gas, and when the water returns, the heat is released. Efflorescent hydrates will lose water to the air if their vapor pressure is more than the vapor pressure of water in the air. Hygroscopic hydrates pull water from the air, and they're used to pull moisture from packages and are known as desiccants. So that stuff that they, they have, the bag of stuff that you put in your basement to dry it out, that's a hygroscopic hydrate. Deliquescent hydrates pull so much water from the air that they get wet, and they spontaneously form aqueous solutions from the water in the air. Certain types of salts will do that as well. Okay, so let's look at mixtures that aren't solutions as our final item of the lecture, and then we will conclude. Suspensions are mixtures that slowly settle upon standing. Particles of a suspension are more than 100 times bigger than that of a solution, so suspensions can be separated by filtering. Colloids have particles between the size of a suspension and that of a liquid or solution, so they're smaller. They don't settle or filter, and emulsions are colloids of liquids and liquids, and milk is an example of that. It's an emulsion um, where you have fat and other molecules that are suspended in the water itself. Okay, that concludes the lecture on water, its properties, and solutions, and we will move on into the properties independent of solutions on the next time. Thanks, and have a great day.